Okay, I think Jasper, you can go ahead and start. Awesome, yes, I will um, allow people to ask questions. So thank you very much for having me. Um, cheers to that, and I know I'm the last speaker of the evening, so I'm hoping you guys are all still pumped for the, for the event. So I will um, talk about a little bit about my research, which is the real paleo diet, how animals uh, started to eat their veggies. Um, so I'll be talking about um, animals that eat plants. And as you can see in this first slide, there are um, a lot of different animals that eat plants. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to eat plants since there's, I mean, there's, for example, uh, you can eat flowers, you can eat bamboo like stems, you can eat grass, you can eat uh, fruits. Um, there's a lot of different ways and therefore uh, plant eaters come in all different shapes and sizes. They appear from the tropics all the way to the tundra. Um, <clears throat> and um, I tried to like, get a bit of a diverse grouping of plant eaters in my slide, but it was very difficult since um, the vast majority of plant eaters today are mammals, which might be an interesting thing to uh, think about why that is. Uh, okay, I mean, all good and well, why would we be interested in studying uh, plant eating animals? Well, they are very important for the ecosystem. Um, first of all, they control um, the diversity of plants in the area. So for instance, if you have a region, um, a grassland that is overgrown with weeds, and you get a few uh, plant eaters, like a few large grazing plant eaters there, they would get away the weeds so that different plants can have the opportunity to shine, um, thereby increasing, excuse me, um, the diversity of plants. Um, but not only that, animals help a lot in um, <clears throat> re uh, plant reproduction, as in, uh, you see, for example, this hummingbird here um, tapping into nectar from a plant that was like spreading uh, pollen. On the other hand, there's animals eating fruits that would like later out, uh, later poop out the seeds, so it helps plant dispersing. <clears throat> and um, in some way, um, plants like that animals eat on them, so they, uh, they grow fruits, they're tasty, so animals are attracted by them. On the other hand, uh, plants also uh, try to defend themselves from animals, so one way is by having thorns. Um, another way, as you can see uh, on this image here in the right bottom corner, a, a parrot eating a chili pepper. So that's an interesting thing because, um, well, everyone who ate a chili pepper probably knows that they're pretty spicy, so they specifically target uh, a pain receptor in mammals, but birds are immune to it. So they kind of prevent mammals from eating it, whereas birds that are much more um, efficient in spreading their seeds um, can freely eat it. So in a way, animals eating plants leads directly to some of our products that we enjoy in everyday life, such as um, spices, but also um, caffeine, um, chocolate, fruits, a lot of different things. So herbivores, are also, um, plant eaters are also important to us. Um, so everyone who has seen a uh, documentary on BBC probably remembers the voice of David Attenborough and him narrating about large herds of, as you can see here, uh, wildebeest, zebras migrating over the Serengeti. <clears throat> There's a fungus, whatever. And this kind of shows how a modern ecosystem is constructed. You have a lot of plants at the base. There are uh, fewer plant eaters that eat plants and even fewer um, carnivores at the, at, the, at the top. And it makes a lot of sense, but this wasn't always so. And for that, I'm going to dive deeper into the past. Um, but first, does anyone have any questions? Anyone want to talk about another plant eater, for example? No? I guess not, okay. So we're just going to talk about the uh, origin of plant eating. And for that, I always think it's useful to um, put in a sort of, well, um, time schedule for a sort of overview. Um, so that's what I put here on the left. Um, on the top, that's the recent, that's this talk happening right here at the moment. And the further you go down, um, the further back into the past you go. You see on the left, um, these numbers, these are millions of years. So I already put a few um, important events that people might know, like you know, the first dinosaurs, 
Um, but if we go way, 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 way back, um, starting sort of with the Cambrian explosion, I may, may, people may have heard about it. It's the first time when we see, excuse me, um, a huge diversity of animals uh, all in the water. But it is about to change. Um, obviously, the first thing you need to become a plant eater are plants. And ideally in a huge quantity. But the first plants already appear pretty early on. Um, so roughly 450 million years ago. This is a reconstruction of some of the plants that um, appeared at the time. So they were the first to get out of the water. Um, they became quite abundant, but they were still pretty small. I mean, it's not really something you would um, find enough for to um, feed yourself for a while. But shortly after, we already have the first um, proper modern flora, which means we have uh, trees, uh, trees with leaves, we have shrubs, herbs, basically every plant type you can think of today was already present 400 million years ago. There were different species of plants that we know today, but they essentially did the same thing. And um, around this time, we also see the first um, animals crawling onto land. First, plant, uh, first proper plants and first um, animals on land. So it didn't take too long before insects um, starting to eat plants. There's um, a lot of uh, fossils of say roots, of stems, of leaves, with like tiny little bite marks of insects on them. And researchers are able to determine based on these bite marks, um, what sort of insects were causing that. Um, but yeah, so far there were only insects doing that. It took, well, another whopping 50 million years before um, other animals um, started to eat plants. Um, this is the earliest example, Desmhatodon, which is found in, um, in Colorado, roughly uh, 300 million years ago. So this jaw here is the oldest jaw known of a plant-eating animal. And well, right now you only see a picture, but I have the actual jaw right here. Um, I hope it's visible. I'm gonna like put it a bit more in the, in the camera. It's not the exact same specimen, but it's a very um, similar animal. I will, I will talk a bit more about it later. Um, so the point I want to um, take across is it took a hundred million years between the first plants and animals on land and animals actually eating the plants. So why did it take so long? That's going to be the next part. Are there any questions? No, I think I saw the chat um, flashing. <laughs> Everyone is really um, amazed by your fossil, by, by the fossil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I mean, I just find some random fossils here in my office. I mean, this is like a plan B, but whatever. You know, it works. Um, so more about this fossil data. Um, the key words, why is it so difficult to eat plants is um, Cellulose. Cellulose is a, uh, a compound, a very complex molecule consisting of different sugars that is very common in the cell walls of plants. It's a very uh, complex molecule. It's very difficult to break apart and very difficult to digest. Um, that's all you need to take from this slide, basically. Um, so we, as in most animals, do not have the capability to digest uh, cellulose ourselves. In order to do that, we need specific micro microbes uh, in our, well, some animals it's in the stomach and others it's in the, um, the cecum, which you see here, which is um, right at the end of the um, small intestine. So yeah, the cecum in plant eaters, it's enormous, it's chock full of microbes that are there, just there to, um, to digest um, cellulose. As you can see, the intestines are way longer, way more coiled in a plant eater, or it can be actually up to 10 times as long as its own body. And on the other hand, we see here the well, schematic image of the digestive tract in a fox. It's basically a direct tube from its mouth to its butt crack. It's very short, it doesn't really do a lot. Um, so this is the key. You need specific microbes to digest cellulose. But how do you get that? Um, 
all animals or most animals are born without these microbes, they're born sterile. Um, and this is usually cited as the reason why it took so long because animals first had to gain these microbes. Um, so one clue is in um, modern reptiles that eat plants, not a lot of them, but in the ones that do, they start out their life um, eating insects. Actually, I said before, insects were the first to eat plants. They actually had uh, the microbes to digest it. So one of the leading hypotheses is that animals gained these microbes um, by eating insects, and then it was passed on that way. Um, also, some reptiles eat uh, poop of their parents or other adults to gain the microbes. And fortunately, in mammals, it is just passed on um, through milk, so it's uh, makes it a lot more uh, convenient. Um, so that, um, that explains that part. Let me see. Any, any questions? No? We cannot judge cellulose, by the way, um, but it's very helpful in um, aiding us to digest anyway. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I should also say here that um, while the gut is a very clear way to distinguish between a plant eater and a meat eater, the guts themselves don't really preserve. Um, they don't fossilize. We don't find fossils of the guts. Um, but in order to host such a large gut, you need to have a pretty ro uh, broad rib cage to well, allow it in your body. And that is something we can find in fossils. So we have questions from Adriana. Yes. Adriana, would you like to? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was wondering when you were talking about, um, you know, how plant eaters have um, the bigger cecum, I think it's called, um, and, and um, meat eaters don't. So do you know in humans, like, does the size change depending on if you eat more plants or for example, if you're vegetarian and you don't eat any meat? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I, I, I talked about the cecum before. It might be a little bit a confusing term. In humans, it's known as the appendix, which, oh, yeah. yes, doesn't really do a lot. Um, so I don't know about anyone who has a larger cecum, um, less for being an infection or so. So I don't think it's a natural way of growing, unfortunately. Okay, okay. I, because I haven't heard of, hadn't heard of it before and I was just wondering if, if, yeah. But yeah, of course, if humans don't have it like this, then yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you go. And also we have a question from Nina. Um, how do we get the microbes if we don't breastfeed? Ines commented kisses. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a good question. Um, so I guess in, so yeah, I think that's, that question is specifically tailored towards humans. Like, you know, every other mammal does do breastfeed. Um, I think in our case, since we don't really digest cellulose either, it doesn't really matter that much. But um, I've heard from some people um, that didn't breastfeed their kids, um, that they have some more difficulty in like digesting some plants, carrots or so, and that leads to farting, like a lot, a lot. So um, I'm not sure how to get this, the microbes otherwise, but I guess there's ways to do it. I hope that answers your question. I guess that's why we, I mean, breastfeed is highly encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, I have a question from a completely outsider. Is cellulose the only thing to consider? The main, I mean, it's probably the main ingredient to consider, but is there, are there any possible compounds in plants in the past, especially because plants might be different? Well, yeah, I think like starch, starch or so, but yeah, cellulose is the main one. Okay. Largely the main one. I can't even name, name others if that's a uh, understand what for. Right. Meanwhile, all clear. All clear, good. So um, with the previous slides, I was hoping to show you that it is um, pretty difficult and you need some adaptations to um, digest plants. And so as you may remember from the um, introduction, introduction slides, um, in modern ecosystems, we have 
um, a lot of plants at the bottom of the food chain, there's fewer uh, plant eaters feeding on them and they're supporting even fewer top meat eaters. Um, however, in the past, this was completely skewed, as in you had a lot of plants, you had very few plant eaters, and then there were more top predators. So what was going on? Um, yeah, that's pretty weird. Um, so even though, even though there were um, large uh, meat eaters on land, um, with terrestrial animals, they still had to go back to the water um, to, to eat. There were like giant amphibians, like giant salamander-like animals. Uh, they were eating fish. There were like lots of large bugs they were feeding on. But yeah, the land was not that kind for them in, ter in terms of um, food supply because, as I said, there were very few um, plant eaters. But let's have a look at them because what was there, um, first of all, is Didactes, which is closely related to the Desmatodon I showed you earlier. Um, so these are pretty large, chunky animals, say around three meters in length. You can already see that they have this um, widely um, expanded ribcage I was talking about. So they clearly, or they probably had a pretty extensive gut. Um, these guys were probably closely related to the ancestry of reptiles, and they were mostly inhabiting. They were living in uh, lowland, marshy, large vegetation environments where they were eating yeah, those sort of plants. Um, but of course, before you can get to um, digesting the plants, you first need to chew. You first need to chew the plants. Um, so yeah, I have a diagram of what the skull and the jaws actually look like, but it's probably better just to have a look at the extra specimen because you guys are pretty excited about it. So I'll show it. Um, uh, let me maybe kind of like if I see my own screen, that yes, it might help because I don't know what you guys are seeing. I only saw June, which is fine, but uh, yeah. So they had this um, chisel like front teeth they were using to crop vegetation, um, that in the first place. And they had this, as you can see here, these pretty broad um, molar like teeth, um, which they you know clashed together to the upper jaw and used it for um, grinding against it. Uh, they did a lot of grinding with their uh, with their teeth. So even if you would look look at uh, the teeth closely with a microscope, you can even see the scratches of um, the teeth interlocking in each other. It's, uh, very good chewing, and some weird feature you might also also notice. Um, so as you see, um, this here is the the upper part of the skull in ventral view. So if you were looking from the from the bottom up. So see this, um, these dots here on the palate, the roof of the mouth, um, there's a lot of teeth. So these guys had teeth on their palate, their teeth in the roof of their mouth, which was actually a pretty common thing at that time. Um, but these guys were pointed, so it's probably to hold plants in the place or something. They probably really well understood why they did that, but well, that's that. Um, but these guys are mainly known from, uh, from the US, Texas, um, and also, we have a couple um, from Germany, from uh, Thuringen, uh, where we hopefully go next month for some more excavations. It's very exciting stuff. Um, but okay, so these guys were pretty large. Not all uh, plant eaters were large in the beginning. Um, I talk about bolosaurs, which are, let me see, um, there's a security coming. So the, yeah, these were um, pretty small animals. Uh, so you can see that the scale bar here, like the entire animal is maybe like 10 centimeters or so in length. And these were the first animals that were able to run on the hind limbs. So even though they were mostly um, going around on all fours, um, in case of danger, they were able to flee on their hind limbs because it's like faster to run. We discussed a very uh, interesting teeth. So instead of the, the crushing teeth I showed you before, um, they had some pretty, well, the base of the tooth was, was flat and then they had a sort of cusp coming over it, um, which if you interlock that between the upper and the lower jaw, it's a sort of scissor, scissors to, you know, um, cut the plants. Um, 
it's very effective way of growing it. Like you can see there, you know, they're pretty small. They have a very small gut as well. But since they were so efficient in chewing, they could kind of get away with that. Um, but one thing I also want to note about these guys is that, um, well, in order to cut, you need to have two you know, opposing teeth. You need to have a tooth on the upper jaw and two tooth on the lower jaw. Because otherwise, if one is missing, you kind of, you know, possibly cut. So um, they have a very extensive tooth replacement. So like in every single tooth, for every single tooth, there's already a replacement teeth sitting there, ready to, when the tooth falls out, to replace it. It's kind of like a shark. It's a continuous um, tooth replacement. So the um, one I showed you now are very invested in chewing, but there's also another way to be a plant eater. Uh, yeah, what to say, it's either wink is. Okay, these are the most bizarre animals I know. One of the most bizarre animals I know. To see this tiny little thing here is the head. And that's its rib cage. It's, it looks like it's completely out of proportion. It looks like they just put things together, but we actually have found complete skeletons of this animal. This is exactly what it's supposed to look like. Um, so not only that, also had this gargantuan um, forelimbs, which they probably used to, you know, dig up uh, roots, tubers um, to eat. Uh, do you have a closer look at the skull? You can also learn about how they actually um, eat plants. Uh, so they had this very simple teeth in front of their mouth for for cropping, and. As opposed to the ones I told you before, these guys don't chew, they don't process, they don't, well, their teeth don't even touch each other. But instead, um, they have a very strong bony hyoid, which is a structure that supports the tongue. So we think um, these guys had a very strong tongue, um, which they use to rasp sort of vegetation to their, um, to their palate, because it's chock full of tiny little teeth, like a shag green. So they would, you know, put the plants against their palate, against the roof of their mouth, and just rasp it around, and swallow everything whole on that, like the, um, yeah, the gods do the rest. Um, yeah, they're basically like walking fermentation fats. Although even that might not be accurate, because some people, there's like the very recent paper that suggested that these guys actually uh, live in water, which, you know, might be a reasonable explanation. Like, you know, they have this very tiny head, very short neck. They have very limited feeding range, but is they, if they live in water, it might help them with getting enough food. Um, but yeah, the evidence provided in the paper is pretty limited. It's pretty poor. Can't really take that. Yeah, I don't. Re I, I really, I really, really, really don't know what these guys actually did. And if I ever had the ability to revive an extinct animal. It's this one for sure. Like no questions asked, no doubt. I will get my katana rinkas. They're awesome. Um, okay. So all the past animals I talked about were pretty rare. That was about to change with the uh, dystinodons. Um, you can see here. Um, so these guys were super abundant. They were found on every single continent. Uh, even Antarctica, like they were, they were everywhere. And wherever they're found, they are the most abundant thing you will find. And they also, uh, they range in size from, you know, rat, uh, cow, ox, even elephant. They did everything in between as well. Um, even though most of them remained kind of small, like the ones you see here. And they were all like pretty recognizable by the fact that they had this uh, short, horny beak. Um, tiny little tusks and a sort of elongated sausage-like body shape. Um, yeah, they pretty much all kind of look the same. But there's over uh, hundreds of species of dasanodons known. And um, these guys are true survivors. Uh, they actually managed to survive the most severe mass extinction that ever happened. Um, that's right here between the Permian and the Jurassic period, 250 million years ago, like 95% of life on Earth was devastated, demolished, destroyed during this time. But the Sinodon survived. And not only that, they aced it. Um, like shortly after this extinction event, if you would go on a safari, 
like 80% of animals you will see are this. Yeah, you, you can't miss it, basically. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, all good things come to an end. So same with Bassanodons. The last of their kind um, remained until the late Triassic, where they actually coexisted with dinosaurs for a brief moment of time, till they finally went extinct on the, well, 200 million years ago. Which I think is sad. I mean, I think they will make great pets. They're very cute, don't you think? I think so. Um, but why were they so successful? The answer probably lies in their way to, again, process their food. So they had this, um, this, is, this is another one. I just have a couple laying them in my office, I know, right? Um, so they were covered with a, well, a horny sheep, very sharp ridges. Uh, around, the, around the edges. They were able, I think you can probably see this better on this image. They were able to slide their lower jaw through, or through their, uh, to the rest of the skull. So they were able to go like forwards, close the mouth, and then a very long stride sliding back, which vastly increased the efficiency of uh, food processing, which probably made them very uh, successful. But yeah. So these were the first ones to graze, to achieve uh, global dominance as being plant eaters. It's very impressive. Uh, recapping, we went from a ecosystem that is dominated um, on top by meat eating animals um, when we had the first plant eaters, but as soon as it started to diversify and increase and spread, uh, we actually went to a more modern ecosystem where um, the terrestrial like land ecosystem is not based on the water anymore, but land animals are able to uh, invade the land further. And that's why the origin of plant eaters was very important for the evolution of modern ecosystems. Okay. And this went on. Um, I taught you about animals that chew and animals that don't chew. Um, so this went on through the age of dinosaurs. On the left, you see a, a ductile dinosaur. It um, really well, took, uh, took over the, the chewing guild and they vastly increased the efficiency of chewing. That's what I they've been doing. And on the other hand, we have um, sauropods, like big long neck dinosaurs, which are my favorites. I'm a fanboy, I know. Um, which are more like uh, cotyderingus in the sense that they just like grasp plants and just swallow it whole and let, let the body do the rest. And even though they were pretty successful, I mean, they were the largest land animals ever walking the earth. And they were also super diverse. But yeah, after they went extinct, Nothing really took over for this role anymore. Everything from then on um, took over chewing. My take home message for you is adapting to plant based diets is challenging. Plant eating animals led to the development of modern ecosystems, and plant eaters have been very important and are still very important in modern uh, ecosystems. And never forget to chew your food. Properly, it's important. Let's have a beer. Well, we have some questions um, already. So there's a question from Vincent. He he doesn't really get why it was sustainable for the top predators to continue eating meat if there were so few plant eaters anyway. About the pyramid figure he's referring to. Hey, that's that's a very good question. I did, um, I know I kind of skipped some parts which actually explain that. Um, but in this time, there were like a lot of, uh, like most life um, would be around the oceans, around the sea. Uh, so there's like giant amphibians, which well also like fed on, you know, smaller fish, smaller insects. Um, they got pretty large, they got up to like five, six meters. They were pretty, pretty good. So they were also carnivores or meat eaters themselves. They was be a pretty good food source for a larger, um, um, you know, part of your own land. But, or if you're asking like, okay, but were there no uh, plant eaters in the sea? 
Well, so I guess if you go like all the way back, you have algae or plankton in the sea, um, which, I mean, if, if they do photosynthesis, you might call them plants, but that's a bit of a, an iffy, shaky uh, term. So anything that eats is plankton is not, is not considered to be a herbivore, more like a, well, a filter feeder carnivore. So things feeding, there are no plant eaters in that line, even though they go all the way back. I hope this makes sense. Does it make sense, Vincent? Could be an explanation. I'm really curious, Jasper, how, how is your research conducted I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis? What, what are your research methods? Yeah, it's very unfortunate that I couldn't see it in the lab I, I, I wanted to sit, but um, I can probably like, show this, this beautiful jaw again. So um, I'm studying the anatomy of the jaw, mm -hmm. uh, how, they, how animals use the jaw in chewing. I, I'm always, my main interest is chewing. Um, so I'm studying the anatomy in some more detail, but we also um, scan this, uh, these jaws in a CT scan, which is you know essentially the same thing you use. You know when you break an arm or so, when you break a bone, you go to the hospital they make well an X-ray, which is a CT scan. Um, so I can basically look inside uh, bones, or even if you have well. A, slab of rock with a bone in it, I can extract the bone virtually. Um, so I'm making 3D models um, of these jaws. And my, my well, final or ultimate question will be, how did these animals use their jaws? What is the most optimal way for them to use the jaw? And I think we briefly talked about it on the, on the picnic as well. So I was using a tool we kind of stole from engineering Mm -hmm. um, called the finite element analysis. You can forget it immediately. But the idea is that we, or I would uh, apply a virtual force on a model that I make. And then I can calculate how this um, force is distributed over the jaw. So where are the strong points, where are the weak points? And I can sort of model the effects of different uh, chewing behavior so I can see what is the most optimal feeding behavior of this specific animal. And I try to see if there's um, differences or similarities between different animals. Mm -hmm. um, and right now I'm still in the scanning and making the models part. That's taking a lot of time. It's a really nice fusion of methods. Um, I think so. Yeah. Can be an engineer too after you finish your PhD if you want. <laughs> Um, there's a discussion ongoing in the in the thread. Um, did dinosaurs get drunk if they ate fermented fruits? Uh, um, well, Thomas, the brewer of beer, said probably a lot of animals do this day of age, and yeast and moles are one of the oldest organisms before animals. He knows. He know, He knows the stuff. Thomas really knows the stuff. Um, but so to come back to this, there we have found. Um, poop of dinosaurs, where there's actually some ferment stuff in there. So yes, it's clear that dinosaurs ate it. <laughs> yeah, of course, you need to ask if you have like a 50 to you know, 80 ton animal, um, how much alcohol would they need to drink before it gets any effect? Um, that's probably a lot. So I would say it really depends on the size of the animal if this had any effect on it. That's a boring answer. I don't know. We can imagine. <laughs> you can imagine. There's I mean, probably paleo art on that. Imagine what they felt. At that. I would not be surprised if there's paleo art on that. Yes. Is there any other questions? Um, who anyone wants to raise their hands or more in the chat? Otherwise, I will ask you one question. One. Um, there is one question. Meanwhile. Um, so, um, a question of Amhet, he was wondering, based on your fossil tooth, is it possible to determine if terrestrial plant eaters arise as an adaptation of the carnivore amphibians? Example, oldest ones being less adapted to eat plants than the later ones. Right, okay. I, I, um, if I may like, paraphrase the question, do you mean that, um, do you have like a sequence from um, this is a purely carnivorous animal. This is a purely meat-eating animal with like super sharp teeth, and we see that the teeth change to a 
plant eating diet? Is that, is that what you're asking? Uh, because if that is so, um, the answer is um, possibly, but it's unfortunate that we don't, that we don't, okay, really, okay, so you confirmed it, that's great. Um, so, so basically every animal needed to be, you know, uh, perfectly adapted to its own environment. So only if this sort of intermediate diet was working at the time. Um, also, um, fossils are pretty scarce. So if you, if you want to have a sequence, you need to be extremely lucky. Like it's, uh, the fossil record is very patchy. So you might at one point have a carnivore and then, you know, 10 million, 10 million years later, you find a herbivore and you don't really have the things in between. So we don't know. It's a boring answer again, sorry. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. We just heard from Costas about some big data where there's a lot of data. And whereas for yours, it's as soon as you get one sample, it's precious. <laughs> it's Am I right? <laughs> I mean, it, p p people are doing big data analysis yeah. as well, like doing diversity studies over certain mm -hmm. time, uh, scales. But yeah, there's a lot of biases you need to take into account. Um, you know, if you have, um, so like in, in some places you might have, um, a very great preservation potential. So you find a lot of different specimens and then in another place, it might be the same sort of environment, but you have um, less good preservational potential. So you find less animals, but it doesn't mean they were less at that time, they're just less preserved. So there's a lot of things you need to take into consideration, but those studies are being conducted. It's, it's way over my head, really. I like to focus on the actual specimens themselves. Right? Um, so what brought you to this field? Well, oof, that's a good one. Um, so, like to this field, to paleontology or to my, to my specific plant eating question? Mm, I, I would say to your specific plant eating. Okay. Type. Yes, I mean, I got into paleontology being like, I wanted the dinosaurs and nothing else, like probably every kid. Um, but as soon as I like, entered this field, I was like, there's so much more, really. There's so much uh, diversity of ancient, ancient life. is amazing. So I really didn't want to focus on a specific group of animals. I wanted to um, tackle some more large-scale ecological questions where I was like looking at many different uh, animals. And uh, to me, the evolution of plant eating is a very big step in the in development of ecosystems, mm -hmm. but uh, on the other hand, it's very underlooked. Yes. It's underlooked. Whatever, it doesn't it doesn't receive enough attention. So, really happy to uh, to join in. Yes, we have more questions. Uh, two more questions, actually. One from Aina. Um, did the hubby forest dinosaurs also eat rocks to grind the plant materials like modern birds do? Yes. Yes, from a lot of them we know that because um, you can, if you find like a complete skeleton of a dinosaur, uh, you can so, um, sort of see what is in like the stomach um, cavity or in the gut cavity. And some of them there's actually rocks and you might be like, okay, maybe the rocks fell in later. But the rocks are actually very well polished, so we know they've been in, in the stomach for some time, they've been digested, they've been etched, and these were actually rocks swallowed by the animal itself. Yes. Uh, not, only, not only birds, it's also, even horses do that, did you know that? Horses also, also swallow rocks to help them digesting. It's a very common thing, really. I didn't know all this, now I do. Thanks to <laughs> all of you. <laughs> Another question from Nina, what's the coolest specimen you've worked so far? You work with so far? Oh, what's the coolest specimen I've worked on? Uh, do we need to answer now? <laughs> I really no, don't we, can, we can move this to the uh, mingle session, actually. Uh, okay. since we are, but we are right at the time for the mingle session, actually. <laughs> um, the birds poop the rocks, I just see. Um, well, in, in my mind, you know, bird poop is very liquid. I haven't seen any rocks in there, but I don't really know. Okay. Well, I think we will um, 
well, not really end this, but we will end this official time when we go to the mingle session. We can still continue to ask about um, this.